Welcome. Uh, I have with me today um, a very important gentleman um, from the continent of Africa. His name is Michael Cassidy. Michael, welcome. Thank you so much, Lars. It's a privilege to be with you. You have spent um, your lifetime on the African continent, and you have been involved in some significant issues uh, in South Africa, your, your home country. Um, you founded an organization called African Enterprise. Can you tell us a little bit about African Enterprise? What is that? Um, well, African Enterprise is a, it's an interdenominational, obviously non-racial, pan-African ministry, which is geared for evangelizing in the cities of Africa. Mm -hmm. That was our calling mm -hmm. to Africa, to evangelism, mm -hmm. to the cities, mm -hmm. leadership circles within the cities, mm -hmm. uh, and especially to do it in partnership with the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the very, very, very first board meeting we ever had, I was still a student at Fuller Seminary, mm -hmm. and that was in February 1961. Um, but I only got going full-time in the work with a small team uh, in end of 1964. Right. And uh, there are now 10 teams around Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, we continue to be focused into the cities, mm -hmm. into the leadership. Mm -hmm. We're involved in you know, practical projects mm -hmm. as well as proclamation of the gospel. Mm -hmm. We've been involved in justice and peace issues as well. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's been a fascinating and wonderful experience. Very challenging, yes, of course, <laughs> because Africa is challenging, yes, uh, as, uh, as 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 you know. So, yes. it's been a thrill, and God has used the work. Of, um, but but tell me, um, how did you did you come with this vision? How did this vision come about for you to begin this African enterprise and be involved in so many significant issues on the continent of Africa? Well, it was a real surprise to me, I have to say. I mean, although I came from South Africa um, and I had a concern for my country, mm -hmm. I only came to Christian faith and commitment mm -hmm. when I was a student in England and I was about 19. And I was planning on, at that time, on either being a lawyer or a schoolmaster. Uh, and when I came to Christ, I... I obviously began to think differently about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Thought about my future, about my career, uh, about what I would do. And I found that my attitudes to everything changed, mm -hmm. uh, to my family, uh, parents, mm -hmm. siblings, to the context, mm -hmm. to the issue of apartheid. Mm -hmm. Although even from the time I was 11 or 12, mm -hmm. I was politicized and conscientized to understand apartheid was wrong. Mm -hmm. and sinful and evil, you know, and, you know, and terrible. Um, but I thought maybe if I made a contribution, I would do it on the side, perhaps through mm -hmm. political means or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the, my, my life trundled along, and I found myself in 1957 uh, uh, at the Billy Graham Crusade in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and after one of those meetings, I was down in the basement, there where people were being counseled and so forth. I just was there out of interest uh, and uh, ob observing what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, something, a voice came to me. Mm -hmm. I've only had this happen a few times in my life, almost like an audible voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and the Lord said to me, I want you to do evangelism mm -hmm. in the cities of Africa. Mm -hmm. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I, I was so shocked because I was very nervous of public things, nervous of public speaking, nervous of social situations. Mm -hmm. So I sort of said to the Lord, well, you don't normally make a mess up and big mistakes, but you've made one now <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not your man. I can't do this. But it wouldn't let go. And from then on, I, 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 I was a cold person. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I, I first saw city evangelism through the Billy Graham team. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the very beginning, that became a little bit of our model. Mm -hmm. um, although I, I was no Billy Graham, nor ever could be. Mm -hmm. But it was, um, the, you know, the model of the more the crusade type of thing. Mm -hmm. 
But as we went on, the, the Lord changed the model. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, we came to, a, you know, use a different methodology to, mm -hmm. to, t to you know, to tackle mm -hmm. cities. Mm -hmm. So it was just a real surprise to mm -hmm. me that that was where I ended up, not my family or friends or anybody mm -hmm. ever could have anticipated that this was where mm -hmm. my life and destiny would finally take me. Right. Well, I want to uh, share a little bit more about that in a moment, but let me just get back to what you said about when you were a 19, um, you know, a, a young man studying uh, away from home, studying in the UK, and you became a Christian. Yeah. You, and that had a significant impact on your life in terms of your whole outlook on life yeah. and eventually your career. I'm sure you would have been a fine lawyer in, uh, in, <laughs> in, in South so. Africa. My wife said I'd let everybody off if I was a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but tell me, how, how did your Christian life develop and, 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 and influence and shape the vision that you ended up with uh, for 50 years or more in South Africa? Well, I was very blessed uh, last through having friends around me in the Christian Union at Cambridge right. because there were, there were great discipling processes. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, the man who led me to the Lord was a long, young Anglican law student mm. and he insisted on meeting with me once a week um, in term time at university mm. uh, for an hour or so uh, for two years. Wow. Man. So, I mean, in other words, I was... Yeah. I wasn't just left, yeah. you know, like a little baby without milk or food. Right. Yeah. And he followed me up and, and discipled me. Also, the college had a weekly Bible study. Mm -hmm. um, the university as a whole, all the colleges and the university mm -hmm. also had a weekly Bible study. Mm -hmm. And so my mind was beginning to be shaped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think also I was, uh, I was introduced early in the day to the habit and principle of reading, of Christian reading, mm -hmm. and that, that shaped me. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, uh, a couple of heroes mm -hmm. came into my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the first one, not surprisingly, was um, Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. And the second one was John Stott, mm -hmm. who came to the university regularly and spoke there and preached there. Mm -hmm. And um, and is an is an alumni of, uh, of Cambridge himself. Yes, yes, yeah. he was. Yeah. He, by then, he'd, he'd left he'd left the university, um, and he was a young rector from London. Yeah. And these two men shaped my ministry, I think, mm -hmm. more than anybody else. Billy Graham for his spirit, his passion in preaching, mm -hmm. his absolute conviction of the lostness of man without Christ, mm -hmm. and. Uh, his loyalty and faithfulness to the gospel, mm. that really ins inspired me, you know. Mm -hmm. And the man's humility was amazing. Mm -hmm. John Stott, I was inspired by his content, mm -hmm. by thorough preparation, mm -hmm. by, by the way he went, he went mm -hmm. about it. And um, mm -hmm. he, he, he was so diligent in his preparation, mm -hmm. so thorough. Right. And I admired that. And so these, these two men who remain f friends, uh, all their lives mm -hmm. um, touched me very, very deeply. Mm -hmm. And those things began to right. shape me. But then when you completed your studies and you went, uh, you returned home and back to South Africa, South Africa in the 60s was a very different place from what it is now. It must have been, I think, very difficult in the context of apartheid for you to have your evangelistic campaigns as you wanted to practice. How difficult was it in those days? <laughs> well, yeah, when, when the Lord was starting to call me, I got, I got given a little leaflet or kind of a tract, and uh, it had in it there the words, are you, are you called to launch out on a great enterprise? Uh, you must do so because this thing is from me, and I have given you the possession of difficulties. Mm -hmm. That was a very strange little phrase. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've given you the possession of difficulties. Mm -hmm. I mean, Africa generally, and South Africa particularly, they, these are contexts of great, great difficulty. Mm -hmm. Nothing was straightforward. Mm -hmm. And of course, as soon as we got into uh, a ministry in South Africa, mm -hmm. we were immediately face to face with the system. Mm -hmm. And it was our conviction and our resolve that we would not have 
uh, segregated meetings. Mm -hmm. And th this, this, this landed one in collision, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. first of all, with the social mores of, uh, of most white people. People did things separately. Mm -hmm. And it landed you in collision with the system, mm -hmm. with the government. Mm -hmm. And it brought one under suspicion from mm -hmm. government authorities, from uh, police, from uh, security police as well. And it, it made everything very, very difficult. It was, everything was uphill mm. because you were fighting against mm. um, a corrosive mm -hmm. and evil system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, it meant that we had to struggle through with some courage mm -hmm. and we had to challenge um, the system mm -hmm. in all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. The one was, of course, refusing to have segregated, you know, mm -hmm. meetings, mm -hmm. and um, the other was simply to speak specifically about it mm -hmm. um, and challenge it in writing and in word. Mm -hmm. And when we would preach, let's say, on repentance and faith, mm -hmm. the, the repentance category mm -hmm. uh, would not only be repentance from uh, dishonesty or wrong ambitions mm -hmm. or uh, immoral sexual behavior, but, but repentance from racism, mm. that you can't come into Christian life with the Bible in one hand mm. and apartheid in the other. Mm. Mm. And so that always landed one in trouble. I remember mm. after one big campaign we did, I was preaching in a stadium, and uh, I'd been there from Monday to Friday, mm. to Friday night, and then people came to me after the Friday night I spoke on repentance from racial sin, the Lordship of Christ. Mm -hmm. And some whites came to me and said, you preach so well through the week mm -hmm. and why spoil it by being political <laughs> on the last <laughs> night? Mm -hmm. And I had to say, well, why is it political? Mm -hmm. why, why is it political to oppose apartheid mm -hmm. and it's not, to politi not political to support it? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, one was in these dynamics, Lars, which made life quite complicated, really. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, it, it did. But, 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 but Michael, from, from earlier on, I end, I'm learning from you that you believed in the power of the gospel to affect change. You believed the gospel could make a difference in the difficult circumstances of apartheid South Africa. But then comes that, that pivotal year, 1994, and you had the leading role in uh, the affairs of South Africa at that particular uh, point in time. Can you tell us about what happened then? Well, it's a big, it's a big story. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the first thing I would want to say is that I was just one of hundreds of people who played a part. Mm. The Lord allowed me to play a part, but there were so many others. There were the big politicians, mm -hmm. you know, the Mandelas of this world and the de Klerks of this world. Uh, and you knew them all. You had to interact with well, them. Well, uh, yeah, after fashion, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and there were other political uh, prophetic figures or religious prophetic figures like Desmond Tutu and Frank Chikani, Alan Busak, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and different people, and many ordinary ministers. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to play mm -hmm. a part by, by the Lord's grace. Mm -hmm. And as we, uh, you know, as we moved towards those uh, elections, um, into that home straight towards mm -hmm. uh, April 27th, 1994, uh, I, I brought in some of my colleagues from outside mm -hmm. uh, South Africa, mm -hmm. from independent Africa. Mm -hmm. And we brought in a, a, a team of colleagues and we began to travel around to the major political parties, mm -hmm. to the heads of the parties. Mm -hmm. Everything from a communist party, the central committee of the African National Congress, um, th the, the, through the Pan-Africanist Congress, they, mm -hmm. their slogan was one settler, one bullet. Mm -hmm. And then on the, the far right side, uh, people who wanted a separate state, mm -hmm. uh, a, a white, you know, Bandistan, mm -hmm. I mean, a white, a white separate state. Mm -hmm. um, and their slogan was give us a million guns and we'll solve the problem. And we went around and we prayed with all of these different leaders. It was quite an experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
they were very touched to be prayed for. Mm. We didn't go to preach to them. Mm -hmm. We went to try and understand them, mm. to care for them, to pastor them, mm. to pray for them. Mm. I mean, when I went to the ANC meeting, Mandela was out that day, actually, but it, the meeting was chaired of their executive by Mr. Oliver Tambo, mm -hmm. who was the president of the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. And they said to everyone who comes here to mm -hmm. the Thule House, they come and talk politics and money. Mm -hmm. But you came and you ministered to us, mm -hmm. which, which we had sought to do. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, we, we realized that um, a lot of these leaders were using similar language. Mm -hmm. They were talking about they wanted, they wanted democracy. Mm -hmm or they wanted prosperity, they wanted harmony in the country, they wanted peace, mm -hmm. you know, and all of this kind of thing, mm -hmm. human dignity. Mm -hmm. And so we, we felt, well, they're saying this to, uh, to us, but they don't say it to each other. Mm -hmm. And so we launched an initiative of, of what I call dialogue weekends, dialogical weekends, when we took politicians away. Mm -hmm. um, we, we chased them down until we uh, got them to agree to come. And in, in the year of, of uh, end of 92 through 93, we had six of these dialogical weekends mm -hmm. involving 92 political people. Mm -hmm. And we brought the mix together, Lars. That was the interesting thing, from the far right to the far left. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just Christian groups. I mean, Christian leaders. There were communists. There were Muslims. There were secularists. Mm. There were there were atheists, mm. there were some Christians, but because we were the hosting group, mm. we were able to inject a spiritual uh, component. Mm -hmm. We tried to pray at the beginning of each day and mm. and say a little prayer at the end of the day, mm. and and then, then the the approach was mm -hmm. to have everybody share their personal stories and autobiographies. Mm. And uh, it was in the chemistry of sharing and of encounter, people, you might say 92 enemies came mm -hmm. over the six weekends with between 15 and, you know, 20 politicians at a time. They, they came enemies and they left friends. Mm -hmm. This was really quite an amazing, you know, experience. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were developing a network mm -hmm. now of people who were related to each other in, in, in some fashion. It was, it was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. But as we got into the early um, 90, I mean, into, into early 94, mm -hmm. the situation was so deteriorating mm -hmm. that um, the clerk and Mandela especially felt that international mediation was necessary for South Africa. Mm -hmm. that the wheels were falling off. Election was coming, and, but there was so much conflict, mm -hmm. especially between the Zulus and Natal, who, who uh, supported Prince Mangasudu Butlezi, mm -hmm. and the Zulus and Natal who supported uh, Nelson Mandela in the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. Nine million Zulus, so it was powerful mm -hmm. collision. Right. Um, and, and, and it really was quite serious. And we had the privilege of bringing into South Africa mm -hmm. um, a brother called Washington Okumu, mm -hmm. whom we had met. He was a Kenyan um, economist, diplomat. He'd studied at Harvard under Kissinger and so forth. And we brought him and we took him around mm -hmm. and we had him meet many of the players that had come to our mm -hmm. weekend dialogues, which we held out in the bush where people could be private and could have some fun and mm -hmm. meet discover their common humanity, go on game drives, you know, and this kind of, kind of thing. So we, we had him connect to this, this group. Mm -hmm. Meantime now, uh, de Klerk and Mandela are bringing in a group of mediators led by Henry Kissinger mm -hmm. um, and Lord Carrington, the mm -hmm. just British, former... British Foreign Minister. Yeah, Foreign yeah. Secretary of, of Britain. Right. Um, and we got Washington Okumu to be made an advisor mm. to the international mediators. Well, they, they met on the night of uh, April 13th, mm -hmm. uh, Kumu and Kissinger and some of the, the major political players. But the night of the 
The very next day, night of the 14th, Akuma rang me and he said, it's all collapsed wow. in less than 24 hours. Mm. And he said, Kissinger's going home. He, he's declared Armageddon will be here in two weeks' time. Wow. The U.S. State Department, we got a message saying they anticipated a million dead in Natal alone, the area mm. you know, where, mm. where, where I lived. This was infecting the whole country, all the, all, particularly all the Zulus on the mines, Johannesburg, and the place was like, you know, a, a powder keg. Right. Um, so the, 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 the amazing thing was that when Akuma said, they're all going home and I'm going home, my response to him was, brother, everybody else can go. They don't understand the situation, but you do. Mm. You, you can't go. And by God's grace, he agreed mm -hmm. to stay on. And so in those few days from uh, uh, the, the 14th, 15th, 16th, uh, Akumu moved around amongst the players. Mm. And he was trying to work on a way to bring the uh, Butelezis and, and Carter Freedom Party mm. into the election. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. He began to get a meeting of minds. Mm -hmm. We had called for a prayer meeting on uh, the, the, um, the 17th of April in a rugby stadium in Durban. Uh, we didn't know whether five people would come, 50 or 5,000. 25,000 people came to the wow. prayer meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole country is praying. Mm -hmm. We've got 10 days till the elections, mm -hmm. and the place is on fire. Mm -hmm. So while those, all those people out there were praying, in the VIP lounge overlooking the stadium, <laughs> uh, Mandela's representative there were, was there in the person of, of Jacob Zuma, mm -hmm. now president of South Africa. Mr. Donny Scudder was a cabinet minister in charge of the elections and representing mm -hmm. um, de Klerk. Uh, minister Butelezi was there uh, mm -hmm. himself and so you had these major players. Mm -hmm. Akuma had gone off that morning to, at Mandela's beck, beckon, beckoning to go to Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And while we were in the prayer meeting, these three senior players found agreement around this document wow. mm -hmm. that Akumu had come up with. Mm -hmm. And by the end of that day, Butlesi had met with the Central Committee uh, Donny Scott had reported back to de Klerk. Zuma, no doubt, had reported to Mandela. Mandela. Mm -hmm. And Washington Nakumo was with Mandela. By the end of that day of, of prayer, mm -hmm. there was a basic accord. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the, on the uh, 18th, the, 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 the day after the prayer meeting, they, they dotted the I's, they crossed the T's, mm -hmm. they finalized it, and then on the next day, Tuesday the 19th, mm -hmm. Mandela and de Klerk Butlesi came on radio and television mm -hmm. and said, we found a way to go forward wow. with uh, election. Yeah. So there were just nine days to go, mm -hmm. less than nine days. It was a week, actually. Mm -hmm. They had to adjust 84 million ballot papers. Mm -hmm. The parliament had to meet. The newspapers last didn't have any lang normal language for what had happened. Mm. So secular newspapers said, miracle, 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 miracle. Mm. One paper had a huge headline mm. which said, the day God stepped in to save South Africa. Mm. And yeah. we realized that, I mean, you know, all over the country, people fell on their knees and wept. Mm. In the newsrooms, there was a holy hush. People reached for spiritual language mm. to describe what had happened. Mm. And long story short, you know, seven days later, the country went to the polls. It was like peace broke out. Mm -hmm. The area where I was, people were dying 20, 30 a day, 70, 80 at the weekends. And after that, after we'd heard the elections could go ahead, mm -hmm. peace broke out. Mm -hmm. The elections were held on the 27th and 28th of April 1994. Several of the most crime-free days in the history mm. of South Africa. In our area, which had had terrible murder and mayhem, there was not any crime, 
of any sort that the police had to attend to. Mm -hmm. God had stepped in. Mm -hmm. And so peace came to South Africa. Right. And maybe just one other thing to add, that on the day of the election, I had been confined back to bed by my doctor because I was suffering from chronic, chronic physical and emotional exhaustion. Mm -hmm. I got up and I went with, with my wife and our lovely domestic helper to go and vote, and I came back. As I got back home, there was a swish of wheels coming into the drive of our car, and I looked out and I saw two or three big Mercedes. And out of the one was this cabinet minister, Donny Scutter, in charge of the elections. And he came in and he said, it's all happening, and I just have come to say something to you. He said, I want to tell you, everything politics could do, everything power could do, everything money could do, we tried. And nothing worked but this initiative in which we had got God involved mm -hmm. and prayer involved. Yeah. That's the miracle that came through and he even spoke about it in Parliament. Uh, Michael, it's a, it's a remarkable story about the power of God to intervene in a nation's life in a remarkable situation. Um, in a sense, the whole world was watching South Africa. You know, we um, all over the world were uh, paying attention and wondering what would happen. And those were remarkable days. But I, I must ask you, Michael, you would have learned, um, I'm sure, a thing or two about reconciliation. Because ultimately, this is what the new South Africa was going to be about, reconciliation. And you were able to take, through African Enterprise, that message to other parts of Africa, to Rwanda, to Burundi, um, to conflict zones across South Africa, and even as far as Northern Ireland. I know, you know we haven't got much more time, but we certainly would love to hear you tell us something about the Ministry of Reconciliation, how important it is, is it, for the church to play its part in reconciling peoples together? And are there things that we can learn about the, the principle of reconciliation? How does it work? I, I think the first thing to establish is that God has reconciliation high on his agenda. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, whole, the whole thing of the, of, of the cross, mm -hmm. it's, it's all about being reconciled to God in Christ, mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 5. Mm -hmm. But the Lord doesn't want just a vertical reconciliation. Mm -hmm. He wants it horizontal. Mm -hmm. And so Matthew 5, uh, Jesus says, if somebody's got something against you, mm -hmm. and you're trying to be religious with your gift and so forth, go first be reconciled. Mm -hmm. Forget about the other religious displays. Mm -hmm. Go first be reconciled. Mm -hmm. Because we can't have a credible witness to a broken, unreconciled world mm -hmm. unless we come with the good news of a reconciled community. Right. Um, that that, 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 is, that, that is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. And then I came to believe, you know, that um, the, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Now, I realize that's a preaching word too, but I came to believe that mm -hmm. this is uniquely the ministry of the church. Mm -hmm. now, uh, the ministry of reconciliation not given to the government, not given to the military, mm -hmm. not given to the academy, not given to business. It's uniquely given to God's people. Mm -hmm. And it's in the spirit of love and forgiveness mm -hmm. that we can, we can address people and try to en enable them to see the dynamics that need to mm -hmm. operate for reconciliation mm -hmm. to take place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, we had to help people understand that mm -hmm. the past needed to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. You needed... You needed repentance for past mistakes and mm -hmm. sins, but you needed forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know, I think when de Klerk came out, what was president and, and uh, let Mandela out, mm -hmm. I think in measure there was a, it wasn't just political pragmatics, I think there was a, mm -hmm. a, a sense of repentance. We really got this thing wrong. Mm -hmm. But the very big factor in South Africa, the bigger, bigger than everything, mm -hmm was that Mandela came out in a spirit of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think that, that Africans generally have a great capacity for forgiveness, but Mandela was mm -hmm. ex exhibit A. 
uh, especially after what, 27 years? 27 years. I, I mean, in prison. If you and I were put away for two years or seven <laughs> years, we'd be bitter as could yeah, possibly be. Especially under the circumstances of Robin Island. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely. 27 years. Yeah. And he came out and he said, it's forgiveness. Yeah. He said, I'm not, we're not going to have Nuremberg trials. Yeah. We are going to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission right. where we want to hear the truth yeah. so we can identify the evil and uh, the people repent of it. Mm -hmm. And then we will grant amnesty for that and we, we will forgive that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are principles we mm -hmm. sought to mm -hmm. apply when we were in Rwanda. For example, uh, uh, our, our role was modest there, but we were in the, our team played a major role mm -hmm. in, in trying to, to, to bring forgiveness between uh, Hutu and Tutsi and Tutsi and Hutu. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same kind of thing uh, in Ireland, we had the privilege of speaking and ministering both in the, uh, the Southern Ireland and in, and in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. and and one somehow had to try and say to people, you've got to forgive the past. Mm -hmm. You've got to let the past go. Um, and you, you, you've got actually to forgive each other. Mm -hmm. And you've got to stop remembering every terrible thing that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes we want a good memory, yes. but I think we need a good forgettery too. Yes. So in Ireland, we try to say, you know, Stop holding on to the past, forgive the past, mm -hmm. move away from it mm -hmm. to a new day. Mm -hmm. And then we sought to give them a hope for the future, mm -hmm. a vision for a future. Mm -hmm. People won't, you know, if you're counseling a married couple, mm -hmm. um, they won't get healed in that marriage until they get a vision and a hope of what a good marriage could really look like. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to hold up a vision of what a a new Rwanda would look like, or a new Burundi would look like, or a new Ireland, mm -hmm. you know, would look like. There was a, a, a song which the, uh, used to be sung in the civil rights movement in the United States in the 50s and that, called Keep Your Eyes on the Prize. Yes. Yeah. And people have to get an idea of the prize. Yes. What do you want of yeah. a healed, reconciled, peaceful, nonviolent yes. country? And so that was a sort of vision we try to hold up. And then I think, you know, in the Ministry of Reconciliation, it's, you're trying to get people to hear the other side. Yes. There's an old Latin saying, says, Audi alteram partem, which means hear the other side. Listen to the other person. Mm -hmm. um, and when you really listen to the other person and their story, mm -hmm. you understand why they think the way they do, do what they do, and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. And the capacities to, to come together and to mm -hmm. forgive become mm -hmm. quite real. I think, I think Rwanda is a fairly classic right. case, I and mean, it's, a, it's a quite a stable and peaceful country today. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael, you know, as you shared with us just now, my mind is going back to uh, the situation, for example, in Syria, uh, where it is in just, and, and, and of course, in, 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 uh, in Israel. Um, the, the conflicts that are, are existing around the world, some of these intractable conflicts have been going on for years, which seems to have very little hope of resolution, uh, much less reconciliation. Um, you talked about hope just now. Do you really have hope that we can find solutions in some of these difficult places in the world, such as in Syria, such as in uh, in, in the Middle East. Uh, well, yeah. now you're throwing me in the deep end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we have had, we had the privilege of ministering uh, quite uh, uh, a major effort in, in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. And we were ministering amongst uh, Israeli believers and Palestinian believers. Mm -hmm. And once again, the, um, the, the you know, the amazing, uh, the amazing challenge there was to help them connect and find each other. Mm -hmm. We had gatherings, for example, like a big picnic on a Sunday, where Palestinian Christians and Israeli Christians came together. Mm -hmm. And for many of them, it was the first time of dialogue, mm -hmm. you know, and of, 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 of attempting to connect to each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what we found was that, that as they, sh as they mm -hmm. shared, they demythologized each other. 
and they, they, they found that there was more that they had in common mm. than uh, mm. divided them. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the amazing thing there was that we did see some, mm. some healing between Israeli Christians and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Palestinian Christians. Mm -hmm. um, but the process, it, there had to be some real listening. Mm -hmm. In fact, we also had another occasion when we drew, we had a kind of a secret meeting on the island of Aegina, as never near, near Athens. Mm -hmm. They'd never, uh, we never publicized it, but we had 14 Arab nations plus some Israelis mm -hmm. come together. And the, 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 the challenge was to keep them talking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I stood at the door three or four times when the Syrian delegation started running out the door saying, we're going to get a boat, we're going back to the mainland, and it's all over. I said, no, brother, you stay there. I'm <laughs> shutting the door. You can't come in here. Good. And uh, Good. to force people to listen to one another. Right. But you know, Lars, you, you, you put me and probably everybody in the world in the deep end if you talk about Syria now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's going to require some very wise heads because when the thing has gone down so yeah. into such depth and complexity, mm -hmm. uh, it's really, really hard to know. And the mm -hmm. same, the same with, uh, with Israel and Gaza. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the way through is. However, what I do know is that prayer is maybe the most critical imp component. Mm -hmm. It sounds so pietistic. It sounds so airy fairy, so spiritual and non practical. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I came to believe in South Africa, and I shared with folk in Northern Ireland and, and the Re uh, Republic of Ireland and so forth, was that if you win the battle in the heavenlies mm -hmm. in prayer, mm -hmm. you will begin to see the battle won on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it, it may somehow be that. There is not enough prayer from around the world. This is a global question now. Mm. It's, it's not just something involving, you know, Christians in Syria or Iraq or whatever. Mm. The whole world church needs to take this on its heart. Mm. And every time we see pictures of Syria or, you know, Iraq or stuff in Gaza and so forth, mm. it needs to be cause for prayer. Mm. Uh, so win the battle in the heavenlies and we may see something happen mm -hmm. you know, on the ground. Right. Well, that's a real challenge that you've given to the global church, uh, Michael. Um, uh, the power of prayer, as you've experienced in South Africa and others have experienced around the world, when you are in a situation where, humanly speaking, there seems to be no way out, no resolution to this thing. Uh, sometimes we have no other recourse but to rely on the divine, to trust that uh, in our prayers, in our what we call intercessory prayer, that uh, God would hear our prayers and step in and bring healing in our land. Michael, we could go on and talk for a long time. You have so much to share and we've benefited so much from the vast experience you've well, had uh, you. on the continent of Africa, but across the world. And we want to thank you very much for being with us. Michael Cassidy, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a privilege. Right.